Uh, hello everyone, I'm really delighted you could join us here today and I hope you've been enjoying Association Weekend so far. So my name is Rachel Thorley, I'm one of the engineering fellows here at Churchill and it is my pleasure to introduce to you today Mike Gascoigne. Uh, Mike did his engineering degree here at Churchill matriculating in 1982 before going on to his PhD in fluid dynamics also here at Churchill. Um, he's had an illustrious career of 25 years, maybe plus, in at the pinnacle of motorsport engineering, um, starting as the head of aerodynamics at McLaren in 1989. He's also founded his own company, um, MGI, uh, which was founded in 2003, and through various incarnations as vertical advanced engineering and now back to MGI, um, this is uh, translating lightweight F1 technologies, systems, solutions, and agile processes to um, EV toll or electric ver vertical takeoff and landing um, aircraft. Um, so, and uh, that's what Mike's going to be speaking to us today about. Yep. So, without further ado, thanks over very to much. You, Mike. Yep. Thanks very much. Well. Thank you everyone uh, for coming and for those who are online. Hopefully um, we can have an informative and uh, entertaining uh, discussion. Um, so when I saw the title um, that was put out about this, about the, the future of carbon-free uh, aviation, that wasn't actually the title that I'd supplied. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and, and was a little bit more honed and, and weighty than I was kind of uh, expecting. So. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today is um, uh, about my career in Formula One, um, what I've learned from that, and what Formula One is good at, and why that applies to what is a novel uh, and new form of aviation in the term in, in eVTOL aircraft and that. So um, there will be uh, a mixture of some engineering and, uh, and also some, some motor racing. So, um, starting with electric aviation and, and EV toll. So, what is it? What does it stand for? And why is, why is everyone talking? Why is it the holy grail of the aviation world at the moment? And what's quite surprising is when we talk about electric aviation, you actually see very few conventional electric aircraft flying. You know, you'd think you'd see equivalent of Cessnas and light aircraft flying with electric power. And, and there are very, very few. And actually, there was an example recently, the Rolls-Royce Excel program, where um, they um, uh, beat the electric aviation world speed record, um, which was comparatively low. Uh, Rolls-Royce sponsored a, um, uh, a vehicle. Actually, which MGI, we did the um, sort of structural composite work for that because it required a structural battery case um, for the aircraft. But eVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing. So they take off and land like a helicopter, um, and, and vertical takeoff is a challenging thing. And the first thing that springs to mind is why are you doing that with, you know, if it's a novel form of, of aviation and battery powered, why are you doing the most difficult things? Why are you trying to take off vertically and fly an aircraft? Um, so these aircraft, they use smaller, you know, unlike conventional helicopters, using multiple rotors, distributed power, um, direct drive motors, and that's one of the reasons it is relevant for vertical takeoff, because you don't need complex gearboxes and heavy gearboxes that go wrong. You can have direct drive motors and um, distributed motors. And there's kind of three types of uh, eVTOLs. Um, there's wingless multicopters, and there's an example down there um, from a company called uh, Velocopter. And again, typically using smaller motors, multiple rotors, um, vertical takeoff. But essentially, the problem with rotor-only aircraft is that they're flying at a lift-to-drag ratio of one. So uh, you've got to put all the power into keeping the aircraft in the air. So inherently, they're low duration, small range vehicles. Great for inner city, if you want to take a hop in an inner city, great. But if you want to get, uh, travel any sort of distance, they're essentially inefficient aircraft. Um, 
Then you've got um, lift plus cruise wing design, so more like conventional aircraft with wings, but um, you're using electrical power to lift the plane up vertically, and then you're using thrust motors to fly conventionally like an aircraft. And then vectored thrust wing design, uh, which essentially you're using uh, motors that you vector and transition into being a conventional aircraft. And I'll go into this more. more. So the buzzword UAM, urban air mobility. So apparently we're all going to be jumping into these things and flying. It's a little bit like when you watch, um, don't shake your head yet, sir, I'll come to that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but we're, it's going to be like sort of Star Wars. There's going to be these things flying in multiple sort of uh, aviation lanes and we're all going to jump into them and it's going to free up all the roads in our cities and um, uh, it's all going to be green and it's going to be lovely. And, and you know, things like that will come eventually. Um, but and, and the market is predicted to be huge. I mean, the numbers there uh, from Morgan Stanley are, are a $59 trillion business by 2050. So, you know, it'll be one of the biggest global industries. For an industry that hasn't done a single passenger mile, apparently by 2050, it's going to be worth $60 trillion. So there's some engineering challenges involved in this, and we'll get stuck into them. And then another buzzword, advanced air mobility. So actually a wider thing. So rather than these vehicles in an urban environment, actually in a wider sort of, uh, sort of worldwide context. So rather than flying people and cargoes in urban environments, the wider market, so flying to islands, uh, mail delivery, supply delivery, this sort of thing. And, and there's... Um, Everyone is concerned about urban air mobility. It's very much the popular subject, but we'll talk more about um, uh, advanced air mobility later. So advantages, potentially the advantages, because we've got to get there. Um, cheaper. It's going to be cheaper than, um, than flying with conventional helicopters and that. But there's no proof it's going to be cheaper. They're saying it's going to be cheaper. You've got to develop the technology. You've got to have clean energy. Um, you've got to have the infrastructure. And you've got to have batteries, um, which aren't the simplest and cheapest thing to develop. So potentially, it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be quieter, because electric motors are nice and quiet. But these things all have rotors. And anyone who's ever heard um, uh, helicopters flying around. It's normally the rotors you hear before you hear the, 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 the engine sound. So you're going to have um, still noise associated with rotors, but potentially quieter. Environmentally friendly, of course, electric, only if you're using green energy and only if you're recycling batteries and, uh, um, and, and the vehicles themselves, the carbon fibre, and potentially safer. So they're saying that these things, because they're not using gearboxes and the like, they're going to be the same level of safety as a conventional um, airliner. Whereas helicopters sort of fly, have safety risks based around 10 to the minus 7, airliners around 10 to the minus 9. So that's why you don't fly helicopters over urban areas. That's why they don't fly over inner cities. Um, you know, in London, they'll fly down the river or to Battersea, Heliport, but they're not flying unless they're police um, or emergency um, vehicles. So they're potentially going to be safer. But there is no justification for that at this stage because they haven't flown any of them. So how can we say they're going to be safer? So that's to be proved. And we kind of talked about the, the applications. So passenger eVTOL, the holy grail, two to four passengers plus a pilot. Um, 20 miles range seems very small, but that's for rotored powered aircraft and up to 150, 200 sort of mile range for um, these vehicles and flying up to sort of 150, 200 knots. So they're the targets, they're yet to be achieved, but potentially uh, if you can do that, there's a market for those vehicles. But the other advanced uh, air mobility um, sort of thing, so 
mail deliveries to Ireland, supplies to Ireland, medical supplies um, to the UK. The Royal Mail are, are trialling um, autonomous drones at the moment to fly to um, the, the, the UK islands. Vertical lift, so in, in a city environment, replacing cranes by a vehicle that can just vertically lift um, up to, say, 500 kilos. Um, so vertical lift and application. Lots of maritime applications, so ship to ship transfer. We've all seen two ship, the pictures of two ships and pulling nets across on wires or whatever. These sort of things transferring ship to ship and also ship to shore. Um, a lot of um, large container ships and that never go into ports. They're all moored 50 miles offshore in these big um, ship parking operations. And you've got to supply them. You've got to take spare parts out to them. Same with offshore platforms and um, oil platforms and the like. Um, disaster relief is obviously a clear thing. Recently, we had the Tonga um, uh, volcano disaster where they couldn't get aircraft in for quite a long time because the main runway was uh, covered in ash and they couldn't get to the other islands. And obviously, the applications of EV toll with a combination of um, wing flight and vertical landing, uh, there's an obvious application. Um, defense and logistics in defense, unfortunately, at the moment, a very uh, topical um, topic, um, but uh, um, potentially a large market, and of course, medical evacuation and potentially autonomous medical evacuation. So, there's a lot of people trying to do this in the industry, um, not necessarily big names outside of the uh, aerospace world, but new companies, startups, Joby, Archer, um, Lilium, Vertical in the UK. And they're all aiming at this market and making claims about when they're going to be flying these vehicles and, and, and what they can achieve. And there's major players in, from the automotive world. Hyundai and Toyota are putting a lot of effort into it. They're putting a lot of effort into electric vehicles. They're putting a lot of effort into hydrogen-powered vehicles and then uh, eVTOL applications. So there's a lot of people trying and uh, a lot of people making claims. So if we just look at the air mobility market, just very quickly go through this, um, you can see it growing 2030, 35, 40, from sort of uh, 60 um, billion US dollars up to 220 billion US dollars by 2040. And the relevance of this slide is just to look at the distribution. Um, until 2040, only about 50% of that is passenger application. So the rest of it is the other sort of things we're talking about for uh, advanced air mobility. And that will become sort of relevant. So done the sort of serious bit. Let's go into how I got here. And um, so the first thing is um, I did my first degree here. And then I'm always very careful to point out I studied for a PhD here because I didn't actually uh, write up and finish my PhD. So that's very important to, do, to say. And my PhD was actually in computational field dynamics. So at the very early stages of the use of CFD. So in that stage, there were no commercial code. We were writing our own codes in Fortran. So um, in 2D, um, working on the university mainframe overnight to try and run these things. So very much the early days. And I remember coming back here after I'd been in Formula One for a few years and talking to uh, Bill Dawes. Um, and I apologized for not having finished my PhD. And he, he, he looked at me and said, well, there's plenty of time. There's plenty of time. But um, the one thing I say is with CFD now, uh, unfortunately with my PhD, any, and I used to say any um, undergraduate student in aeronautics can do my whole PhD in about two days using a commercial um, package. And that came to the stage where, well, anyone can do it in two days on their PC. Um, and now, basically, anyone can do my PhD in about half a day on their phone. So there's not much <laughs> point in me going back to it. I'll, I'll leave it. So, um, and the reason I didn't finish my PhD was very simple. I went and got a job um, down in Yeovil working for Westlands, um, doing some computer simulation work while I wrote up. And while I was there, um, I was bored one lunchtime, 
and I read a copy of Flight magazine, and in the back of that, they had an advertisement for uh, a job advert for uh, an aerodynamicist at McLaren. And McLaren at that time in 88, they just won 15 out of 16 races. Um, they were the dominant team. And I thought, that looks great. Very interesting job. I'm an aerodynamicist. Um, I'd had no interest in motorsport. Um, and then I looked at the front of the magazine. It was three months old. So I thought, oh, well, you know, um, that will have gone. But anyway, I wrote off and I got a letter straight back. And I thought, well, that's the, we filled the, the job and thank you. And it said, give us a call. So I gave them a call and they said, can you come up tomorrow? So I drove up there and did an interview and they called me back a couple of days later and said, congratulations, you're our new head of aerodynamics. And, at, and actually, before I went into the interview, I went to the local um, uh, uh, news agent in, um, in Woking where that factory was and bought my first ever copy of Autosport because I thought I ought to read it and find something out about this industry. Um, which, and obviously, it's pretty good because I got the job. But I'm always asked by students, you know, how do I get into Formula One? What should I do to get into Formula One? And my answer is, well, be in the right place at the right time. Don't ask me because I just got lucky. So, uh, but uh, as in life, be in the right place at the right time. So I started at McLaren and uh, was head of aerodynamics. So actually, as an aerodynamicist, ended up in a job where I worked for eight, ten hours a day in a wind tunnel. So dream job. I had a team of about 10 people working for me. Um, I was actually designing parts for the wind tunnel, which would eventually hopefully go into the, onto the car. Um, so I had wind tunnel technicians and uh, uh, one draftsman working for me. And it was a great time, but high pressure time. We had two drivers, Ayrton Senna and Alan Prost. Um, we were fighting Ferrari in 89 in, um, and 90 for the world championship. Um, but, a, but a great time for me and um, uh, a great learning experience. Um, uh, a bit daunting when you go to the racetrack and Ayrton Senna asks you why the car's not quick enough. But um, uh, and The first thing about motorsport and Formula One in particular is every car is different. So each um, entrant is a constructor. And 95% of the performance of an F1 car is about the aerodynamics. So if you look at the car on pole and you're two seconds off pole, 1.8 of that is aerodynamics and the rest is the other bits. They're all equally as important, but aerodynamics is king. So, um, you know, a lot of effort and it was still very early days in motorsport. McLaren were testing um, uh, five days a week, eight hours a day, and, and that was quite a lot compared to most. They had their own full use of not their own wind tunnel but one at the um, National Physics Laboratory in Teddington. Um, and we won the World Championship in 89. We won it in 1990, which was the first car I'd sort of done the whole aerodynamic package. So I was pretty pleased with myself. And then Formula One reared its head. Um, so having beaten Ferrari in 1990, where Alan Prost had left McLaren and gone to Ferrari in quite a lot of acme and a lot of tension between the drivers, Having beaten Ferrari, um, at the end of 1990, um, they hired the head of aerodynamics from Ferrari and sacked me. So um, that was a, a real introduction to motorsport and the way it works. And um, I actually left there and went to a small team called Tyrrell and met a guy there called Dr. Harvey Postlethwaite, who was a fantastic uh, engineer, experienced engineer, mechanical engineer. Um, he'd worked with James Hunt and Hesketh at, at Hesketh Racing. Um, actually, if you see the documentary, the film Rush, Harvey appears in that. And he sort of became my mentor. I followed him to Sauber, um, which were going to um, uh, do the entry into Formula One for Mercedes. And we set that team up together. I set up the aerodynamics department there um, and then came back with Harvey to Tyrrell. And, uh, as, and that was a big step for me because I was a deputy technical director. So I wasn't just an aerodynamicist. I was now in charge of designing the whole car. Uh, also in charge of the team at the racetrack. I ran the team on the pit wall in 94 at Imola when there was the tragic circumstance of the death of Roland Ratzenberger in qualifying and Ayrton Senna in the race. Um, and all the things that came out of that, the safety things with the technical working group, I was involved in that. Um, Tyrrell was a fantastic 
team, a very inventive team running off, very inventive group of people running off a very small budget. And we used to say at Tyrrell that actually our development list was exactly the same as Ferrari's. So if they had 100 things on the list, we also had 100 things on the list. The trouble was we could only do the first three of them because we didn't have any money, and they could do 100 of them. So what you had to do, and it was very important lesson, is that you had to prioritize and you had to pick the right things to do. And one of the first things Harvey Postlethwaite ever said to me was that there's a 1,000 people in that pit lane that can design you a racing car. The trick is to design a quick one. And uh, the application of that very simple statement was the key to why Tyrrell um, was such a good place to, to work and such an inventive place. At the end of um, 98, Formula One intervened again and uh, the Tyrrell family sold the, um, the company. Uh, you know, Tyrrell will always be the sort of love of my life from a working point of view. Um, and I, uh, but I had to move on and uh, I got a job as technical director at Jordan working with Eddie Jordan. Uh, one of the more colourful characters that's been in Formula One. Um, and we won the first races there and uh, for Jordan and had a very successful year as a small team. I was headhunted um, then to go to the Renault team, headhunted by a, a team principal called, called Flavio Briatore. So if you want someone more flamboyant than Eddie Jordan, then Flavio Briatore was probably um, the next best thing. Um, so very interesting time working with young drivers like Fernando Alonso, Jensen Button. Um, we took that team, which was in decline, back to winning races and set up the team that eventually in 2005, 2006, won um, two world championships. So a very successful period uh, for me personally. And all of this was about the application of aerodynamics into Formula One. It was about science of experiments, doing aerodynamic research correctly and properly and professionally, which wasn't being done in Formula One and then delivering performance. Um, I then um, was approached by Toyota and went over to Germany um, to do the same job for them. One of the things is there was sort of, you know, sort of four or five top technical directors in Formula One and most of them moved around the top teams. And I was the guy that always went to the team at, towards the back of the grid and sort of brought them up to the top. And one of the things you learn in life, there's plenty more teams losing than there are winning. So um, that sort of, that's why there's so many teams on this list. Um, so uh, again, I took um, Toyota onto the podium um, in my first, the first car I designed for them. Um, we were meant to score one podium that year. We scored five and we scored 90 odd points. Um, start of the next year was a little bit more difficult, but at the third race, we finished on the podium again. Um, that was in Australia. I flew back to the UK and they rang me up at six o'clock next day and sacked me. So um, uh, again, maybe it's just me. So maybe, may, <laughs> but um, uh, Formula One politics. So from there, I had some time off. Um, I was paid to have quite a lot of time off. And then I went through um, the Spiker Force India team. And then in 2009, I set up um, a new team in Formula One, um, which was called Lotus Racing, which became the Caterham F1 team. So very few people, and I did that through my company, MGI. So very few people can say they've set up a Formula One team or that company has set up a Formula One team. And I fortunately did that. We had a great first season. Um, we got to the first race. We were given the entry at September the 12th, 2009, and we were on the grid in March the 8th in Bahrain, and both cars finished the race. Um, we were the only one of the new teams that, that finished the race, and we finished 10th that year, secured prize money. So great experience, a little bit um, of a rock and roll experience. How we managed to avoid all the pitfalls and be there was, was, was looking back on it, I'm not quite sure how we managed it, but a great time. And then um, I got involved in the wider Caterham group, working with Renault to, on road car projects and other projects. And really, I came to a stage where my time in F1 was kind of done. I'd, um, there's only so much, um, so there's only so many airline queues you can stand in and still find it entertaining. I did something like 380 Grand Prix. Um, so I've done quite a lot of them. Um, I don't have any great desire to go back to a racetrack in the near future, but it was a great experience. But, you know, my, my race was run, as they say. 
Um, and I was working with my company, MGI, and uh, doing some consultancy work. And we kind of set up MGI to hire ex Formula One people who, like me, didn't want to work seven days a week, um, sort of uh, 15 hours a day, and but still wanted to do good engineering and um, some fun projects. So we set up MGI and initially started doing sort of motorsport applications and motorsport projects. But very rapidly, it became clear that we were being invited to do more and more aerospace-based projects. And a lot of that was composite aerospace projects, so designing parts for A320neos, um, for Bombardier, for Boeing. Uh, a lot of it replacement parts for existing structures, but redoing them in composite, taking weight out of the aircraft. And this sort of, sort of moves on to, to, to the point of the story, if you like. So MGI will quickly go through this. Um, we started doing more and more aerospace work. We then did a project for Stephen Fitzpatrick, who owns Ovo Energy, but also owns Vertical Aerospace. Uh, we actually turned a Formula One car into a track day car for him. And he then asked us to supply um, engineers into, um, into his eVTOL company, uh, Vertical Aerospace. And in fact, he bought the company, which is why we became Vertical Advanced Engineering. We expanded and we spent two years as Vertical Advanced Engineering. And then we um, parted company and we're back as MGI again. We won't touch too much on why we did that. But um, uh, part of the reason was that I wanted to work on more diverse projects, and I also wanted to fully exploit what um, Formula One technology into the aerospace industry. So, um, uh, and really, at this stage, having worked in eVTOL, I found a project that, to me, really excited me, like Formula One used to. Because here was a project where Essentially, it's a new technology, it's a new class of vehicles, and you're right on the limit of being able to do it. And the main challenge is flying an electric vehicle, batteries, um, the sort of uh, eVTOL ta air taxis you're talking, you're talking about, a ton of batteries, uh, half a ton of you know, people, if you're talking five people, and they're a small bag. So the challenge of electric aircraft was one that, to me, um, was really something that um, uh, needed what F1 could bring to it in terms of uh, engineering and challenge to make it an industry or to get over the line and to get these things so that they are uh, performant vehicles. So why is that? What do I mean? Well, <laughs> Formula One is a bizarre world, very, very bizarre, um, in that it has no commercial sense. Um, in Formula One, you just spend all of your money to go quicker. You're not interested in anything else. When I was at Toyota, I was, you know, the, the, the sort of Toyota way, you're giving these targets to do, and they gave me a budget, which was something like um, half a billion dollars um, to design a racing car. And they sent me this challenge target to say 5% on that. And I said, well, we can't. And they said, well, why can't you? I said, because I'll spend it to go quicker. So if we do all that I said we're going to do, we have 5% over, I'll spend that 5% on going quicker. Or give me 5% less. I don't mind which, but you know, the ethos is not to say 5%, it's just to go quicker. And in that, winning is everything, competition is everything. Every two weeks, you have a, a, a KPI printed to the world. It's called the World Championship Table. And where you are in it says how good you are. Where you're on the grid says how good you are, how well you're doing your job. So Formula One spends money on things that you would never do commercially because you'd never get your money back. So just to save a few grams from uh, a composite part by molding it differently, or, and they spend money to do that because it gives you performance. Because if you're on pole by one hundredth of a second and you win the race, that was all worth it. And the trouble is you've got to run to stand still in Formula One. So you're constantly developing in the smaller teams, you know, um, bless them, and I was in some of them, um, you know, you, you're just running just to stay at the back. 
Um, and when you look at budgets in Formula One, when I, the Caterham team, 50 million pounds for um, a back of the grid team. And you're competing against people who've got 100 million or 250 million pounds. So people have got double your budget or three, four times your budget, but it's, it's not that simple because when you've got a 50 million pound budget, 45 million of it, you have to spend just to make a racing car and all the bits and fly it around the world and compete in the races. So you've got 5 million to improve it. Still a lot of money, but that's... But if you've got a 100 million pound budget, it still only costs you 45 million to make all the bits and fly them around the world. But you've got 55 million to spend on making it going quicker. So you don't have double the budget, you've got 10 times the budget to go quicker. And if you've got 250 million, you, you, you've got 40 times the budget to go quicker. So it's a very unfair world. That's why all the cars are lined up on the grid two by two by two, because people have just done it better, and that's how quick they are. No motor racing driver can get over the laws of physics. The car's as quick as it can be. They can get a lot of things wrong, um, but um, you know, ultimately the car is as quick as the engineers and the aerodynamics make it. But there's this relentless progress and this relentless change and design. Every, new, every year you design a new car, 4,000 parts, you build and make a new car. And someone has to sit and design every one of those bits. And in all of those bits, you're trying to reduce the weight. You're trying to increase the performance. You're trying to increase the stiffness and reduce weight. You know, I talked about aerodynamics being king, and it is, but center of gravity height of a car is, is, is king. So if you can save 50 grams from the rear wing, and put it down in the bottom of the car, you've lowered by a tiny amount the center of gravity hat. And if you do that with everything, you'll know it significantly enough that you've got a quicker racing car than the people who can't afford to do it. Lots of team principals used to get very annoyed with me because we'd spend all this budget on reducing the weight of the car. And then we'd spend a load of money making um, uh, tungsten plates, which is a very difficult material to machine, very heavy to put in the bottom of the car, and then we'd fly them around air freight around the world. And uh, team principal, but that's what you had to do to make it go quicker. So you did it. And so what does that, you know, competition was driving the technology. It was driving you to make new techniques to make a quicker racing car. And you had to do it all of the time or get out of the business because you, you weren't quick enough, you lose your sponsors, you're not in the game. So budgets are key. Safety, um, you know, because I was there, you know, as I said, at Imola on the pit wall and those traffic events, and you can never take safety for granted. And the, the technical working group um, that, was, that was in place but focused a lot on safety. And as we improved the safety of the cars, the competitiveness never went down. So every time you said you've got to make... Um, you've got to put this roll structure on, you've got to make this heavier to make it safer. Always the designers would then work out how they can do that and stay just as competitive if it wasn't there. So you've got this constant drive and you, you can never unforget a good idea. So if you've got something that makes you quick and something the rules changes it, then you just do it a different way. You're just clever about it to get that performance back. And you know this picture at the bottom, um, you know, uh, it's something, that, I mean, this is a crash where Roman Grosjean uh, in Bahrain um, hit the barrier. I think he hit it at 59G. Um, the rear of the car came off, as you can see, which isn't meant to happen. Um, the car caught fire, which definitely isn't meant to happen. But what that picture shows is he didn't just survive the 59G crash. He was fully conscious. He took his belt and he climbed out himself. Although the marshals there are being incredibly brave, he got out himself, so he was able to survive that crash and get out. So the safety elements of these cars, uh, you can never take it for granted, but fantastic. So survivability and that, all done in a competitive environment, all done where you're trying to make the quickest racing car in the world. So you can bring the two together with technology, but you need to design and you need to push design. So, oh, excuse me. So what's the relevance of all of that? Why are I waffling on about motor racing? So then you come to 
eVTOL, the market opportunity, as we've said, huge opportunity. There's going to be these lovely heliports everywhere, all surrounded by trees and glass, and we're going to get on and we're going to flit around town, and, uh, and it's all going to be lovely. Um, and of course, it's a dream to aspire to. Um, you know, there's an increasing demand for, for green transport, um, you know, huge investment. All of these things are going to come, but how are you going to do it? Because essentially, um, you know, concentrating on passenger um, eVTOL, um, trying to design and then certify these aircraft is a hugely challenging thing. Um, so, yes, we've talked about noise levels and all that, but companies are saying they're going to be doing this by 2025, which I think is hugely optimistic. So there's a huge challenge here, which the aerospace industry um, is taking up. But I suppose... For me, one of the, is this new class of vehicle an aircraft? And in the UK, we don't particularly have an aerospace industry anymore. We haven't made an air, a full aircraft in, in the UK for the last 60 odd years. We've made bits of aircraft. Um, so, all British? Uh, okay. It's, when did that, where would, that would have been 70s? Yes, 40, 50 years ago. So, but, uh, but nowadays we don't have that much of an aerospace design industry, in my opinion. Um, but are these necessarily, they are of course aircraft, but what they are, to me, is their niche, high performance, hybrid powered, composite lightweight vehicles. And we have the best industry in the world for niche, high, high, high performance, hybrid powered, lightweight carbon vehicles in Formula One. So these are that type of vehicle that happen to fly. Now, obviously adding a third dimension adds a huge challenge and it has, adds a huge safety challenge and you can't ignore any of that. But to develop these types of vehicles, you need to use all the tools at your disposal because weight is the absolute key to carry the batteries that you need to power these vehicles. So you're going to have to push the boundaries of what's possible in the aerospace world to make these vehicles perform to the level that's required. And Formula One has spent all this money learning a lot of these things. So the best thing you can do is apply it without having to do it all yourself again. Now there's huge challenges of some of those things of um, certifying um, the, uh, the aircraft and, and what's current practice. But the simple fact is we, we, um, we, don't, we don't make planes out of, out of wood and, and, and canvas and dope anymore, you move on. And the aerospace industry must move on and embrace new things, especially in composite. So for me, that's the key challenge. And is passenger eVTOL the right thing to be doing? Because if you want to carry passengers, um, you've got to develop a plane to a much higher safety standard. You've got to put seats in it. They're probably going to want air conditioning and um, screens and all sorts of things. So you're inherently making your job very difficult because you're then trying to do the, the hardest vehicle first, you're trying to certify it and, and, and carry people. And of course, you can't carry half people, you know, so, so you're sort of limited in, 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 in what you can do. You've got to go to a certain level. And um, to my mind, the industry needs to be much more focusing on the wider air mobility picture. So cargo, autonomous cargo. And a lot of the claims that the... Um, uh, the eVTOL uh, and passenger eVTOL companies are making. And of course, passenger eVTOL will be the dominant thing in the end. We will get there. But to me, those claims have to be built on thousands of hours of flying cargo vehicles, thousands of transitioned flights, um, uh, different size vehicles, flying in remote areas, flying over water, so inherently flying in safer 
um, environments if there is an accident, and there will be accidents. And we have to take the, to me, we have to take the step into passenger eVTOL based on, um, as I say, the learnings and the safety record generating from other applications. And at the moment, that's not the trendy thing. A lot of the money and what everyone is aiming at and the investment money is about passenger eVTOL. And I, you know, it's a bit of a corny, you know, the, the industry is trying to fly before it can walk and it needs to take a wider view, in my opinion, and you know, this is all my opinion, um, but it needs, to, um, it needs to do the simpler job first. And it isn't a simple job, it's just slightly simpler. Um, so, you know, there's huge technical risks. Uh, you know, vertical lift aerodynamics are very complex. Transition risks are very complex. Um, you know, large battery storage um, solutions, um, recharging batteries, um, and I'll go into that, and, you know, rapid recharge. The business case for passenger eVTOL says they can only be on the ground for 10 minutes, so you've got to rapid charge the battery pack and fly off again. And the first thing that battery packs hate doing is being rapid charged. It, they um, degrade very, very rapidly. And when the battery pack in your Tesla or whatever degrades, the screen will tell you that you can only do 280 miles range instead of 350, so you've got to stop a bit earlier and charge it. An aircraft can't do that because it's going to fall out of the sky. So, um, you know, it needs, A, the best performed batteries there are, and when they degrade, you're going to have to replace them. So the cost of doing that has to be factored into what you're doing. So then you've got to hot swap batteries rather than um, recharge them rapidly. Well, you've got a ton of batteries. It's not Formula One. You're not going to have 10 blokes rush out and change them in one and a half seconds or whatever. You know, that's a pretty difficult job. But also, uh, the complexities of doing that, because um, if you're going to fly into an inner city, inner city vert vertical port and you're going to drop your battery pack out and put another one in, where's that come from then? How's that got there? Um, and also, if you've got 20 different types of vehicle, um, where are you storing 20 different battery types in the numbers where these things are going to fly every 10 minutes or that? You know, and if, and if, you're, if you're taking it in by a diesel-powered truck every, every, every evening to, to have the battery, that's not a solution. So there are huge lo logistical challenges and in the technical side. Um, and of course, what you need to do is have standard battery packs so that everyone uses the same voltages, everyone uses the same charging facilities and common battery packs. But it's a novel industry. It's a new industry. How are you going to get people to do that? That may be possible 10, 15 years time, but now that just isn't going to happen because people have got different solutions for their aircraft. So huge challenge, technical challenges to eVTOL. Certification. You know, absolutely key to, and uh, quite rightly, to safety and uh, safe operating of, of aircraft. Um, the aircraft on the left, um, I think that's the Bell 525. That's um, the world's first uh, fly-by-wire um, helicopter. Uh, that's been 10 years in certification. All eVTOLs are going to rely heavily on fly-by-wire. And the first vertical takeoff aircraft that's tried to do it has been 10 years in certification. The tilt rotor um, uh, has been in development for 18 years and isn't certified. So there are huge challenges to certifying these aircraft. And the problem is the regulations to certify them by haven't been written because it's a new class of vehicle. So the industry needs to work with the certification authorities to define how you're going to certify it. And then you've got to add in that that it's, in my opinion, it's got to challenge the authorities on novel techniques that you're going to use that aren't currently used to make a lightweight vehicle. So the certification <laughs> challenges are absolutely huge. And, you know, it's going to take time. Infrastructure. Um, now, of course, initially, if a few hundred of these things are flying or they're flying to places like the UK islands or whatever, 
you can use pretty much the sort of standard air traffic control, voice operated air traffic control that you've got now. But when these are operating the sort of numbers you're talking about, that's going to be a totally new system of air traffic control. And of course, you've got to implement that in Europe, you've got to implement it in the UK, you've got to implement it in Asia, you've got to implement it in the USA. And it's all got to be coherent. And the challenges of getting that done again, are absolutely huge and, and entirely in their infancy. It's very nice to have these beautiful CGI pictures of these vertebrates. Where are they going to be in reality? I mean, one proposal is um, when we've all got electric cars and you don't need motorway services anymore, make them all vertiports. You know, actually distributed vertiports around the M25 with smaller vehicles flying into London, um, you know, cargoes, flying in EV tolls from the south coast into those distribution centers and then being distributed. And of course, with motorway service station, you've, you've, got, you've got road access, you've got parking, you've got facilities. You know. So when you're not selling fuel from them anymore, why not? But at the moment, there's nothing. And there's no, there's no regulations about what you're going to need to do them. So huge challenges coming up. And as I say, you can, you can you can tackle it slowly, with, but if you want to make these things to fly commercially and be making money, you don't want to be doing it slowly. You want it happening as soon as possible, and that's not available. Operational, who's going to operate them? Who knows enough about them to operate them? You know, now you have a world where you've got the large amount of Boeing, Airbus, and they sell aircraft to airlines, and they know how to operate them. They've done it for years, and they're very good and very efficient. But what's the new market going to look like? You know, will they know enough how to operate these new aircraft? Of course, initially, the manufacturers will know how to operate them. And a lot of the manufacturers are looking at becoming operators. But again, it's all an unknown. And you can see, you know, areas where you can see pretty much direct. And here I've, you know, Monaco Air, I've flown into Monaco several times for the Grand Prix from Nice Airport. So there you've got a lovely little niche thing. They've currently got a heliport. And you can absolutely see that in two years' time working perfectly. You've got high worth individuals who are willing to pay a premium to fly from Nice Airport or the, you know, the south coast of France into Monaco. You can absolutely see that being a business model, but that's not typical. You know, how's that going to work flying from Heathrow to central London? How's that going to work in all these different environments? And how are you going to operate these things? Um, performance risks. Well, there's two different types of aircraft. There's a very light one and a very big one. Um, and as I say there at the top, the major performance risk for eVTOL, is that someone ringing up saying I'm boring? Or... Uh, <laughs> um, the major performance risk for eVTOL is weight. It's weight, it's weight, and it's weight. You've got to make a vehicle that's light enough. And when we touched on some of those different types of vehicle, remember we talked about the lift and cruise one. So it has motors and propellers that lift the vehicle up, and then it has motors to um, provide forward thrust and fly as a conventional aircraft. Well, typically for a, for a, um, for a sort of four-person air taxi, the weight of those lift motors and the pylons to put them on, the motors, the inverters, the coolers, the props, it's probably around 500 kilos. Well, that's the weight of five people in the aircraft. So, and that weight is along for the ride for 80% of the journey. So you've got redundancy in these vehicles that is absolutely against what you're trying to do with a lightweight vehicle. So you need to have no redundancy in the vehicle. You need to have these complex um, tilting mechanisms so that anything you use to lift the aircraft off is also used to power the aircraft forward because you can't carry any redundancy. You've got a ton of batteries in a typical um, sort of five-person eVTOL type thing or a 500 kilo cargo EV You've got a ton of batteries. Now, you know, so a third of the weight of the plane or more is, is the batteries. Now, when a conventional aircraft flies and a conventional airliner flies, when it takes off, it's pretty similar in terms of ratio and that. But it burns that fuel off. So when it's flying across the Atlantic, and it's getting more and more efficient. The weight's coming down, therefore the, 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 
The lift is dependent drag, which is equal to the weight, is reducing. The, the, the aircraft's coming more and more efficient. In a battery, you're just rearranging a few electrons. You know, it lands with a ton of batteries on. It takes off with a ton and it lands with a ton. So inherently, it's inefficient. And when you talk about passenger eVTOL, the sort of mission profile you're talking, taking off, transitioning, flying, and landing, you need a power reserve that if it goes wrong on landing, that you can take off again and you can fly, there's a current standard about six miles, and land again. That means you have to land, the first time you're landing, you're landing with 40% of the power still in the battery. So you're only using 60% of that one ton of batteries to fly an eVTOL. So the challenges are huge. And the only part that you can make lighter, because you can't ask if, I mean, they probably wouldn't let me on because I'd need to slim down. You can't ask people to slim down. You, the batteries are the batteries. The only thing you can make lighter is the aircraft. So you absolutely have to be pushing the design of the aircraft to the absolute limit. And in Formula One, Formula One runs to incredibly low engineering safety margins. And I don't, I don't mean safety margins in terms of is it safe or not so. It's what you're designing to. Whereas you may have a typical safety margin in aerospace on ultimate load of a factor of two or something. In Formula One, that will be 1.1. It will be absolutely nothing. And the reason they can do that without these things braking all the time, is that they've done thousands and thousands of miles around every circuit. They've hit every bump, every curb. Every so often they do break, but they have a huge amount of empirical data to design to that allows you to design to that limit. They use material properties for the thing, and, and in the aerospace industry, you have to apply huge knockdowns because that material, you know, it may be in the aircraft for 20 years. Um, you know, it'll be flying up at 30,000 feet, so it minus, minus 50 to plus 50. It, um, you know, it may sit on, a, on, on the end of a runway for six months in 100% humidity and sort of 40 degree heat out in the Far East or something. So you have all of these knockdowns. In Formula One, you don't do that because at the end of the day, you throw it away um, at the end of the year. You throw it away, actually, after every, every few races. But... So they are designing to the absolute limit. Now, you can't do the same in aerospace because there's inherent safety requirements. But you also can't be conservative because then these aircraft just aren't going to fly. They're just not going to do the, the, the performance. They're not going to do the range and they're not going to do the payload. So you have to challenge that and push it. And the trouble is, as I said in F1, these cars go around the track, they've got hundreds of sensors, you've got all of this data, you know, thousands of hours of data of all the loads, so you can design to those loads very accurately. None of these have ever flown. So how are you gonna get that data? Well, you're only gonna get it from building them and flying them. You know, that's, that's aerospace, that's aircraft development. But once you've flown that first plane and you've found out those loads, you've gotta go away and redesign it all again. Because once you've got those loads, you've got to say, right, I can now start applying these smaller safety factors. I can start bringing the weight of this aircraft down. And that's what Formula One doing. It's doing it every race, every year. It's, it's pushing it to the limit. But to design an eVTOL, to design one and get it flying is a huge undertaking. You're not going to redesign it three months later to make it better. So you've, but you need to if you want to get the problems. And the person that does will end up being the one that first solves this problem. But there's a huge challenge in pushing those design limits, which Formula One does all the time, and we need to learn from it. And it's very easy for me to sit as a, as a motorsport guy and say, that's what you need to do. But how you do it is, is not, not clear. So as I say, as a summary, this is a personal view, and I'm sure there's going to, lots of people who are going to tell me I'm wrong. Um, you know. There's no reason to doubt the market's assessment of where these things are going to be and the, the impact they're going to have, you know, as a novel technology. Um, you know, it's clear to me, and it's an exciting time to be a designer to try and achieve this. Um, but how soon you're going to implement it and what it's going to cost you, 
I think there's some hopelessly ambitious targets out there. And to me, in the eVTOL market, we have to be leading it with the easier tasks, with cargo eVTOL, smaller vehicles, um, scaling them up, eventually putting pilots in them, and eventually passing passenger evolved. We have to lead it by autonomous cargo um, eVTOL and stall vehicles, so short takeoff and landing, because we're not just going to be able to make this step directly. Um, you know, we need the aerospace industry needs to embrace new technology, and especially in composite technology. And of course, that technology has to be 100% safe. So proving that and that you can do it is a huge task. And I'm certainly don't underestimate the, the issues of, of certification and, and, and adoption of new technology. Um, and, you know, the aerospace industry is pushing and adopting new uh, technology, um, but it has this inevitable conservatism in, especially in large passenger aircraft. So for me personally, it's a fantastic, exciting thing that you can actually make a difference. I started as an aerodynamicist. I'd love to finish having designed a plane. Trouble is in Formula One, every year they throw my racing car into the bin and do a new one. So there aren't any of them around. I'd like to, in 20 years' time, be walking down the street and one of these things fly over and say, that's one of mine. So as an engineer, that really drives me. And one of the things, you know, these are the holy grail of the aerospace industry. We could say, let's go outside and wait for one to fly over. Well, I think we're going to be waiting quite a long time. But a um, little bit of, you know, the Wright brothers made that first step. Why didn't they invent Concorde? You know, why don't they just think about it a, a bit longer? And, well, the technology wasn't there. But um, you've got to get into the market. So in saying these problems, you've got to get into the market. You've got to build a prototype, and you've got to fly it, and you've got to learn. And obviously, they made the, the biggest step. Um, and um, I showed earlier, I didn't mention it, there was a slide about competition and winning in Formula One. And actually, there was Damon Hill on the podium celebrating winning. That was Jordan's first win and a big thing for me. And actually, in that race, there was a horrendous um, first lap um, accident. It was in the wet. It actually was a very safe accident, but something like two-thirds of the field were taken out, um, and a lot of them didn't make the restart, which made our job of winning the race a little bit easier. But I think with eVTOL and the company's eVTOL is one thing they're all going to have to remember is quite a lot of them might not get around the first lap. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for that thought-provoking discussion. Um, we're going to be taking questions from the audience, but first, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we both have everyone here in the room and the virtual audience. Um, so if you have a question um, in the Wolfson um, Auditorium, if you could uh, put your hand up or wave. We've got um, both Anna and Fran on roving mic. And if you would please wait for that mic to ask your question, because uh, our virtual audience can only hear questions that come in through the microphones. Um, and it would help us out if you uh, could just quickly share your name and maybe affiliation before you ask any questions. Anyway, I'll get set up on the computer. And um, yeah, feel free to start asking your first questions. Nothing too challenging, please. You'll be lucky. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Graham Thomas, Churchill, 61 undergraduate. What is the military doing? Because the pressure there is even greater than commercially often. Yeah, I mean, there is um, uh, a, a huge um, sort of defence uh, implication. Um, the Royal Navy um, have requirements for both um, ship to ship and ship to shore requirements. So essentially, rotor-only aircraft and um, uh, a tilted wing aircraft. Um, so there is a large requirement there. Obviously, you know, frontline resupply, autonomous resupply um, is something that's very key at the moment. So yeah, there is, and the drone market in the defense industry is massive. So, um, uh, but certainly the Royal Navy uh, are pushing uh, very hard and there's uh, the Royal, it's called the Royal Navy Heavy Lift Challenge. 
and uh, it's something that we're, we're actively involved in. But the defence applications will, will be uh, very large. And there is a drive there to have carbon-free solutions, even in that sort of uh, rarefied application. Hi there, um, I'm Tom Sharp. I graduated from Pembroke College last year, having studied natural sciences. Um, it was really interesting seeing some of the concepts on there for light aircraft, for cargo and people. Uh, thinking about some larger passenger aircraft, how do you see EV tolls competing with other sustainable solutions, such as there's a lot of talk about hydrogen planes in future? Yeah, I think when you start to look a at range extension, so the use of hydrogen fuel cells, and one of the applications for eVTOL is um, using uh, a fuel cell where you'll have a much smaller battery, you use the power um, density of the battery for vertical takeoff, and then essentially you transition, and the fuel cell can provide enough power for um, your transitioned wingborne flight and recharge the battery such that it's fully topped up for when you want to land it. And I think those sort of things will um, be very, uh, or, or essential for this industry. When you go into larger aircraft, the use of hydrogen um, you, is gonna to have to be the way forward for these aircraft or biofuels. Um, but you've got problems of, you know, as with in the aviation world, storing of hydrogen on board, if you store it as a gas, large volumes are needed. Um, in the aircraft industry, actually storing it cryogenically um, uh, and cooled, and then um, as it boils off, using that gas to drive the fuel cell actually solves a lot of the storage problems. Um, you can't use that in automotive application because you'll fill your car up with um, uh, liquid-cooled hydrogen and come back after the weekend and it's all boiled off and you don't have any. Um, but for aircraft use where you can refuel it, um, it's, it's technically a solution. Um, Having loads of verted ports all around major cities with cryogenically stored hydrogen, though, is going to be a bit of a challenge. But um, certainly range extension, so hybrid version rather than pure battery version is key, will be key. Uh, I'm Arthur Koletsky, undergrad 66, and uh, Boeing 767 in the early 80s, and it's still flying. Um, yeah, um, I just wanted to say, um, the question is, um, the question I have is, why the step of adding the pilot? Because uh, with the timescales we've got in front of us, uh, by that time, we can prob we probably have enough uh, reliable artificial intelligence to skip that. And I just wanted to, while I'm up, commend you for your emphasis on certification, because when I worked in the civil aircraft industry, we didn't see those things as vehicles, as things that flew. We saw them as certification subjects, because mm. that is the problem. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, and there's a couple of points there that I, I absolutely agree. So taking the pilot out of the equation, absolutely, because you, you, you help your weight problem. Um, uh, whether people want to, to fly in vehicles without a pilot sitting up front and trust them initially is going to be a big question, uh, but I, I agree totally. The certification issue, it, it's funny, when uh, we sort of, I came into this world from motorsport, everyone involved in aerospace talked about certification and, and that and said, you'll never certify anything, you know, and if you don't tackle that from the word go, you'll never certify it. And it's actually one of the major lessons I learned is, uh, I think, I don't have all the, but, you know, a way forward or an interesting way forward in engineering terms, but if you can't certify it, it's a complete waste of time. However, if you take the approach that I'll design so I know I can certify it, and you don't have a performance aircraft, you can't carry the load, you can't do the range, that's getting you nowhere as well. So it has to be a mixture of that. And, and I actually said to someone who challenged me, he said, well, as a motorsport person, you know, 
what would you do if you, you said, you know, if you're going to design your own aircraft? And so the first thing is I'll employ 30 certification engineers that make sure I don't cock it up because that's going to be essential. So in sort of saying this new technology, I'm absolutely not underestimating the, the, the requirement and the challenge of that certification and the difficulty of it, which is why I kind of mentioned it. Thanks. Guy in, in front, he looks as though he's going to ask me a challenging question, so <laughs> I'm interested in it. Thanks, Mike. Trevor Cave, undergraduate, 71 engineering. Have you given any thought to hybridizing the lift and having some aerostatic element like a hybrid air vehicle so you are a larger, slower vehicle? Um, I think there are... Um, the simpler is me personally no, and it's a very challenging question, and I'd love to discuss it with you afterwards. Um, I mean, there are, if you look at the, 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 the Lilium jet, for instance, which has the um, small ducted fan electric motors in the wing and a tilting wing. So there are alternative solutions, and I think it's very... Run if you look at a lot of these pictures, there's a lot of CGI out there. There's a lot of very unbelievable aircraft out there. Um, <coughs> But also, these solutions won't necessarily be normal aircraft. And I think that's one thing that you'd, and, and a lot of them, the conventional are normal aircraft. And you've got to think outside that box to, to what is the right solution. Um, do I know it? No, but it's not going to be a conventional aircraft. Thank you. Um, we'll go for a slight change of tack with a, a question from our virtual audience, and then we'll go over to you. Um, so we've got a question here from uh, Thomas Nordberg, who's a Fox Fellow at Sydney Sussex in 2001, and he's um, asked, uh, how would you assess the future of Formula One? Whoa. <laughs> well, and I suppose, I don't know behind that question, but if you're looking at, you know, um, green issues. I mean, it's interesting, I'm here talking about green aircraft and I spent 25 years literally driving around in a circuit burning up a load of fuel around the world so it's the most ungreen thing in the world so you've got Formula E you've got electric racing cars out there but they're awfully slow um, and you know Formula One is incredibly popular so I think Formula One has to address green issues and sustainability issues, especially with flying things around the world. Um, biofuel, um, you know, on the positive side, you know, you're looking at um, hybrid engines in these vehicles that are approaching sort of 50% efficiency from the, 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 the fuel burn value, which is incredibly high. And ultimately, one of the ways to solve our energy, or our, you know, clean energy is to have very clean, efficient ways of, of, of driving things. And actually, small turbocharged engines are incredibly efficient at what they do. So uh, Formula One will always survive. You know, it is a worldwide industry. I think every race is um, watched live by something like 50 odd uh, million people. So it's very public when you're slow, and it's very, very embarrassing. But um, it is a huge worldwide industry, so it will be healthy. But it, it has to evolve and listen to to what um, you know the the you know what trends are in in engineering and worldwide and with the environment. So it has to evolve. But I think it will always be very popular. So I think it's got a very safe future. Yeah, I have no doubt. Um, do feel free to come back to these questions um, online as well for the benefit of the virtual audience. Um, but Anna, could you take the mic up? Thank you, Anil Madhavapedi. I'm a professor in uh, computer science here. Uh, it's really a follow-on to the previous question. Uh, it, it looks like Formula One has driven a huge amount of innovation uh, in in its particular uh, uh, vehicular transport. So why hasn't it taken to the air? Do you, do, you, do you see a role for a really cutting edge, high performance race uh, based around aviation that will help to kickstart some of those issues that you've talked about? Because it's sidestep certification. It, you have to self-regulate, you need 
safety, and you have to define uh, common standards for, uh, for, for racing um, over there. It seems like it, it might be an exciting future, and I'm curious if you've heard of any movements uh, towards that in Formula One. I may have thought about that, and I may not want, not want to talk about it very much, but um, I actually think um, uh, EV toll, an EV toll race series would be a, a fantastic thing. Um, there's huge safety implications of it, but um, building a single-seater EV toll um, to Formula One standards and Formula One safety standards. Um, we've done some calculations as, as, as a motorsports company. We've done some calculations. And if you look at the safety factors that are in an F1 car and what it's built to, um, actually the speeds you crash at are comparatively low because you, in, in a sort of EV, you're only going to be doing 100, 150 compared to, and you're not going to directly hit a wall. So, um, you've just got the vertical element and you've got to not hit each other. Um, now, a lot of work being done on sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, avoidance technology in, in AI, so making sure they can't hit each other. Um, and we've done some calculations and actually, if you limit the height you fly these things, um, the survivability through the, the, the survival cell based on, is, is actually pretty good. Um, it would look very dramatic. So I think that I think there inevitably will be um, a sort of EV toll race series around. And if you look at, I mean, Red Bull Air Race, for instance, that sort of thing, um, they travel around the world. They they have a race. At, uh, at their Monaco is actually down the road at Cannes. Um, they have a problem in that they then have to go and land at Nice Airport. So if you want to go and look around, if you want to go to the paddock, there, there isn't anyone there. Um, whereas with eVTOLs, you could do that in the center of town or over lakes in town. So, so I think there will be a tremendous market. But again, it's not a trivial thing. But you're right um, in that, like Formula One, you know, although it's a very regulated industry and you've got to homologate chassis and safety, it is essentially an unregulated industry. And, and this could be the same and could be a great driver in terms of that technology. And it would be spectacular. Down to the middle at the front, please. How are you, old boy? Very well. Nice, nice to meet you again. Nice to see you. Long time. He spent many, many. I've shouted at him many times in the pit lane. Many, many times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Duncan at Thorpe X, Queens College, and X Tyrrell F1, amongst others. Like in F1, there's been a lot of work done on sim, sim, simulation, of course, over the years. Have you done simulations of EV tolls? And with current technology, can they actually achieve what people are claiming? Well, yes, and simulation both from uh, aircraft performance, flight control, um, because obviously these things are reliant on um, fly-by-wire, so simulating the whole flight environment. Um, Design-wise simulation, um, you know, FE and that to design the lightest optimized composite structures, absolutely. Um, but there's no solution. There's, you have to go and make one, and you have to go and fly one. So yes, you can calculate the loads that these aircraft are going to see from the flight loads, and you design to those loads. But you have to put a safety factor on it. You can't put 1.1 on it. You've got to put two. You know. But um, so yes, we simulate it all. But you've got to get out there and prove it. So, um, you know, and simulation has got better and better. I mean, CFD didn't exist when I started designing cars, aerodynamics for cars, and now they solve the whole vehicle, and, and it's, it's pretty accurate, and it's why you have these incredibly complex things. So, yes, simulation, but you've got to get out there and make one. Um, and as I say, flight loads, how that interacts in the structure, you're going to struggle to take away the safety factors you've got to apply until you've made one and flown one. Um, you know, what the aerospace is, is, they'll say, well, you know, we're going to put two on ultimate load, and then we've got beyond visual damage because we don't know if the carbon part's been damaged, so we'll put a factor of two. And then we've got bird strikes, so we'll put a factor of one. And you end up safety factors of nine and ten, and you've got to get them out and that. And simulation will help that, but you've got to fly them. Brilliant. Um, so we'll take a question from the online audience and then we'll go to John in the third row. 
Um, so this is from Mervyn Chambers, who is an electrical engineer and I believe known to you, having yes. studied engineering and visited pubs with you in 82. Oh, Churchill. Let's not go there. Um, <laughs> no more details here. Um, so he's asking, um, is the answer not uh, now battery technologies rather than lighter composites? Uh, it's both. Um, but if you can't get, if, you, if the battery technology isn't improving, then you've got to do, you've got to do lighter composites. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, if you do both, then the range is just going to go up and the performance of the vehicle is just going to go up. So yes, you need much better batteries, but you still need the lighter. Any vehicle, you need the lighter structure. And actually, there's some conversations we've been having before. You know, you look at things like electric buses. And if you take a current bus and put batteries in it, you've got an electric bus. But a current bus is built out of steel girders. It's an incre it looks like it's from the, the 1920s. Um, so to have a proper range in electric bus, you still need a lightweight vehicle. It's still basic physics. F equals MA, you know, Newton got it right. You know, it's, it's, you've still got to accelerate the mass and that takes power from the battery. And the lighter that mass is, the further and the quicker that vehicle will go in any type of vehicle. So it's absolutely fundamental. And that the, the EV industry actually massively has to learn that. Don't just electrify current vehicles. You've got to make lighter vehicles. Well, I think you've made a point there. So let's um, go to John there. <laughs> Another one from the pit lane. So. It's going yeah, to try John and Sutton, ambush um, me. contemporary of yours for the very same years here and beyond in the pit lanes of the world. Um, clearly, market forces and, and free competition is, uh, at the moment, um, influencing wh who's doing what. But I'm interested in, the, in the, why the vertical takeoff. Do you think, given the relatively small payloads, whilst batteries remain heavy and the structures aren't as light and as efficient as they can be, is your view that uh, people can afford to spend money on something more niche and get it off the ground and that the commercial mass transport will follow later? Because it seems to me as an engineer that wouldn't you get further faster solving the simpler problem of going down a runway where you can generate lift by the speed through the air and not need to have this overhead of power and energy? I agree with everything you've said. And, um, you know, in some ways you look at eVTOL and it's like trying to make a market to fit, to fit the technology, if you know what I mean. Because, okay, well, all other types of aviation, which actually at the moment is more efficient, you know, this is the one thing it definitely can't do. So let's, let's make that an industry. Um, and I think there's an element of that. And I think um, it's why I mentioned Stoll Aircraft. Um, so actually, you know, if you can take off conventionally with one of these aircraft, even if you want to land it vertically, you're just going to fly further with more payload. So it makes a huge amount of sense to do that. Um, there is always a requirement to land places where there are no runways, you know, land in a field on smaller islands, this sort of thing, getting into, you know, urban areas. But, and of course, there's the, the high net worth individual who wants to fly in the flashy EV toll, and he'll pay money to do it. Um, so there, there's loads of areas there, but um, and I think it's going to be a mixture of all three, um, and it's going to be market forces, and and I think the market will refine its ideas. So what what it thinks it should be, it's doing now. I don't think in two three years time, there's a lot of companies will be trying to do different things because they're not getting there with what they're currently doing. But what that answer actually is. If I knew, I'd be a rich man. Great. Um, so we've got a couple of questions in online and one's uh, on a related thing. So we'll have one of those first and then we'll go to Malcolm. Um, so this is a question from Eric Brewster, um, which is saying, thinking not necessarily about EV toll now, but more conventional aviation. Um, how will this technology affect affect or change a general aviation industry? Well, and I think, um, you know, we've been talking to um, the Air Transport um, Institute, the ATI, and actually that's one thing they're very keen, because because you make light, lighter aircraft, you're making greener, more efficient aircraft, even if they've got conventional, you know, um, 
conventional fuels in them. So actually applying this technology and making just lighter aircraft in future. And one of the great things about composite is it's awfully expensive. Um, so the best thing you can do is use as little of it as possible by making the lightest possible aircraft. So uh, I think, although we talk about eVTOL because it's solving a particular problem and that they're not going to get off the ground and be um, commercially viable if you don't solve this weight problem, is absolutely applicable to, to the whole of the aerospace industry. Brilliant. Thanks. And um, I wanted to add that that was from the perspective of someone who is a, themselves a pilot um, and plane owner. So let's see if it happens. Um, over to you, Malcolm. Yeah, Malcolm Bolton, a fellow, retired fellow of engineering. Um, Mike, can I cheekily take you back to your PhD expertise mm -hmm. and ask you, what do you think went wrong with the Mercedes design process this last, this last year, which led to their car porpoising? Well, I mean, they will have simulated that. And, and obviously, they've gone to new aerodynamic regulations where they've got these longer sort of um, ground effect tunnels. And the problem you have in Formula One is you write a set of regulations and sort of 10 guys from the FIA write a set of regulations. And every team has 100 really clever people trying to work out how to absolutely screw those regulations. So you're always going to get these problems, and they're always going to drive to the limit. And of course, the porpoising thing is where you know you have this huge ground effect. The car gets really low to the ground. It, it sort of rubs on the ground and, and effectively loses that aerodynamic effect and pops up and then gets downforce. And so you've got this porpoising. And the trouble is they will it's easy, set the, set the ride height up the car higher and it won't porpoise. So very, very simple to cure, but it'll be slower. And any driver won't care how much as it porpoises, he won't care anything about it as long as it goes quicker. Um, so when you look at CFD tools and that, you think, well, why can't they? They must know that then. They must simulate that. And, and CFD, I mean, you talked my PhD expertise, well, it was the flow around a square object in 2D on a 100 by 200 grid. Um, I think it's a little more complex now. And, it, you know, and, and now when you've got these, you know, sort of 50 million, million cell full vehicle simulations, you know, because in F1, you've got, um, you've got a rotating wheel. Well, trying to solve the problem of a flow around a rotating wheel is difficult. You've got a steered rotating wheel. You've then got a winging ground effect that's running next to that wheel. So all of those separated flows and that trying to trying to um, simulate that in CFD has been the classic issue in in Formula One. And you hear a lot about the things of correlation. You'll hear correlation mentioned by uh, uh, commentators all the time, and it's lack of correlation between what the CFD solution said and what you get on the racetrack. And it's when it's not correlating and. Actually, I was successful in Formula One where there, that problem was between correlation between the wind tunnel and the racetrack. And I was very successful by applying the science and engineering I learned here at Cambridge to that problem and making sure you did very accurate models, very repeatable tests. And then you could absolutely believe what you got in the wind tunnel worked on the track. And that, but that is still an issue. And if you see in Formula One, in um, practice session, you see these huge rakes on the car, these huge pitot rakes. And that's all because they're trying to validate their, their CFD model to, um, to the racetrack. And, it, and, you know, and as they push it, and if you look at the complexity of a Formula One car now compared to, I look at the cars I designed and they look so simplistic and, 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 and you know, they look terrible. Um, hopefully some of them still look quite beautiful, but aerodynamically incredibly simplistic because you didn't understand flow field. You, didn't, you were guessing. And any time I tried to have a theory, if I ever tried to prove that, all I ever did was prove myself wrong. I never proved my theory was right. Whereas now with CFD, you, you, you can see it, you can feel it, you know, you, you've got that insight, but it's still a very, very difficult thing to solve and, and be absolutely sure you can solve it. Um, and what surprises me, actually, is you look at the complexity of these models with these incredibly small little 
turning vanes and fences everywhere. And what I don't get is how that works all the way around the racetrack with all the different combination of ride heights, your pitch angles, steer angles, all of that. Have they really covered all of that uh, to, to that level? So you may have something that works perfectly in one, one, at one point, but does it work in all the points that the racing car sees, especially if you've got a guy driving it, who's determined to go through a gravel trap, who's determined to go over the curb and take half of the front wing off. You know, they absolutely revel in it. So how you make it work for all, it's very difficult. But of course, and it's far more difficult than a conventional aerospace thing. You know, a, a plane in cruise condition, you know, at 30,000 feet, you know, CFD-wise, very simple thing to solve race car incredibly difficult because that is one area where you know um, uh, Formula One is pushing what's possible in the boundaries we'll talk about it we'll talk about it at length afterwards yeah thanks for that and I blagged through the fact that I've forgotten most of my PhD so uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> I didn't get where I am today without blagging a few things so um, we've got time for a few more questions. So we'll take one from the third row. We have one more online, and then there may be time for one more. So um, get you thinking. I'm getting on. awfully thirsty up here. So. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Paul Byrne, also an undergraduate from 82. Oh, Paul, yes. Hi, I'm Mike. You, yes. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, I studied medicine, as you remember, and my question is medical. Is a uh, 59G survival from an F1 crash a world record? And also, while you're thinking about that, how accurate would it be uh, of the force that was actually um, uh, imparted to the driver? Well, so several questions. Because so the G sensor in the car is measure, you know, which is actually has to be there by regulation because it flags up if any impact has been above a certain level, and then the driver has to go to the medical. So. Of course, that's that's what the that's what the monocoque decelerated at. Did he decelerate at that? Probably no, because it's probably not survivable. He's obviously strapped in. He's in a safety seat. Um, he has lots of Comfort foam padding, so a lot of work's gone into so controlling the head in these impacts, ensuring his his, his face can't hit the steering wheel, for instance. The, 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 um, down the the chassis, there's actually padding down for his legs and all of that because. As we've made these accidents more and more survivable, so you get to these higher G levels, you, you start they're damaging more and more areas that we perhaps didn't see because unfortunately they had far more serious injuries before they got there. So what did he actually see? I, I, I don't know. Um, but the sort of the safety system clearly works pretty well. Um, but an, and a huge amount of work has gone into ensuring that, that, that those systems do work. But there are crashes. When I went to Toyota, a guy I knew very well, Mika Salo, a um, very good Finnish racing driver, drove for me for several years at Tyrrell. He'd had an accident for Toyota when they were developing their car, where down the back straight at Paul Ricard, um, the gearbox actually split in two. So the gearbox, it was a carbon gearbox, and it couldn't take the, the loads in the gearbox, and it just split. So essentially, the rear suspension fell off the car. And you're doing about 220 mile an hour, and there's a, there's a separate garage at the back of, on the back straight at Paul Ricard with a concrete wall, and he turned right and hit it. Um, and he, so he survived it, but he was in a full body um, cast for, I think, something like six months to try and rearrange his internal organs um, because they all weren't where they were meant to be. So you are getting into those sort of survivability issues where the car will survive the impact, it will tail those, but, but can the person sitting in it physically survive them? So, but you, the fact you're getting to those limits and learning about it is, is great because it means they are surviving heavier and heavier crashes. Did that answer the question? Jeremy Clarkson has a theory that the, the world's safest yeah, car would be one with a huge metal spike poking out of the steering wheel because everybody would then ride around at 10 miles an hour. But, but flippancy aside, Michael... Yeah. Uh, I don't uh, think uh, you're going to win the race with that approach. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to be honest, 
I've worked with a load of waiting drivers that would ignore it and, uh, and go for it. They, you know, so uh, absolutely, flippancy aside, I, th I think I think we all admire Formula One for its the way it's improved its safe, safety record over the years and how it's filtered down into some of the cars that we drive. And very interested to hear how certification has to lead the EV VTOL approach in the future. Well, and I think that safety, ex you know, the reason I put that up is um, uh, it, it's to show you can design for, um, if you like, um, crashes and circumstances. Someone said, well, that's too random. How can you design for what is a random crash? How do you know what angle it's going to hit the wall at? How so, and what Formula has done very well is every, so after that crash, Next year, the regulations all change to avert the things that happened in that crash. So loads are going up for certain areas. Um, 94, for instance, Ratzenberger, uh, Roland Ratzenberger was killed um, because the, he hit the wall, not at a particularly hard angle, but it ripped the wheel off and it came in through the side of the car and ca in, came through the side of the car and, and caused massive internal damage. And actually Senna the next day was killed by a wheel coming off, so not hitting the wall. That was fine. The wheel came off and came in and impacted him in the head, um, and, and that's what killed him. And you see in Formula One now you have all these wheel tethers that stop the wheels coming off. Uh, you know, in, in um, road car design, so all this end cap safety and five-star safety and similar, a lot of that sort of crash simulation um, is, is now absolutely key. And crash simulation with composite structures used to be a bit of a back art, um, but something that Formula One absolutely does. And what drives it, of course, is they've still got to be ultimately competitive. So it's got to be as light as possible and everything. But the regulation forces them to have crash structures and absorb energy and that. And I think the application of that to um, eVTOL applications and, and passenger survival is very relevant. And it, that understanding of crash, composite crash dynamics, Formula One is way, way above. Precisely, as I said, the fact that there's 20 blokes at two o'clock on every Sunday morning, absolutely intent going down at the first corner to have that very accident. So um, we've got a lot of empirical knowledge correlating how these structures work. Thank you, Mike. So we'll, um, we've got uh, an online question that um, sort of brings us back to the topic, um, the title of this. Um, and I thought we got, thought from we got away from floor. that. Is yours a follow up to uh, this conversation or no, completely different? OK, um, so I think we'll go for your question first, then finish off with our online one. But if we could keep um, both questions and answers uh, fairly brief at this point uh, so that you can go and get that drink. John Ennels, uh, 61 uh, Fitzwilliam. Um, you emphasize the fact that it's very important to make sure you're working on the most important thing. I'd like your opinion on whether the manufacturers of electric cars who seem to be obsessed with disappearing door handles are making the right decision. <laughs> well, I mean, of course, the easy answer to that is make the lightest vehicle. And if a disappearing door handle isn't the lightest solution, don't have it. Um, I suppose you've then got the commercial question is if you make money by selling cars because they've got disappearing door handles, then of course you're going to put it on. So, um, uh, you know, I suppose where I'm coming from is this Formula One thing where it's absolutely about competitive performance. And that's where the EV... To so that's why even... If, I mean... I got shot down massively um, uh, when discussing eVTOL interiors um, because obviously um, you want it lined with Aston Martin leather, and you want uh, you know, in and you want these drop down sort of um, sort of uh, iPad type things, and that. And I was saying, no, what you need is a London taxi. You need two bulkheads and drop down seats and strap yourself in because that's the lightest thing you get. And when someone isn't traveling, you can put the bag there because the seat isn't in the way. And that idea didn't go very far. But actually, that is the engineer solution. That's why London taxis have the interiors they do because they're intensely practical. Thank you. Thanks for all of that. So um, just to bring us back to the future of carbon-free aviation, we've got a question from Sharon Dawes online who's um, asking um, for your uh, 
kind of brief overview of whether anyone is exploring the mix of battery power and solar power um, for vehicles that might fly in sunny climates? Um, if you do the calculations about the surface area of an EV toll, um, where you could put solar cells and that, I think you could supply about 1% of the power required to fly the aircraft. So as a thing that's going to, and, and of course, you've got these fantastic solar things. They've, I think they've flown all the way around the, pla uh, the planet, haven't they? Um, mm -hmm. The solar powered air. But of course, they're, they're, they're incredibly lightweight things with huge, um, you know, surface wing area and that, that charge the batteries during the, the day and then, um, uh, and then they fly on batteries overnight. It's not practical, but I think um, some things, you know, if you want a high use vehicle, then you're not going to recharge it by solar power and that. But if you've got vehicles in, you know, in Africa or something where you might be doing two flights a day, um, you know, is solar recharging, you know, part of the process? It could well be. But the simpler fact, fact is for an operating vehicle, no, it's not practical. Well, thank you so much. Um, you've been a really great audience, both online and in the room. Um, can you put your hands together again just to say thank you to Mike and bring this to an end? Thanks very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you.